fear of failure is actually a misnomer. As I'll explain in a little bit, most people don't actually fear failure itself so much as something much more internal and emotional in nature. As a psychologist, I've worked with hundreds of people who are very smart, very hardworking, and very successful, who nonetheless were plagued almost constantly by this fear of failure. And of course, this is despite a rap sheet of very impressive credentials and achievements from their past. And if there's one thing I've noticed about people like that who are able to successfully overcome their fear of failure, it's this. They all learned to somehow shift their perspective on what fear of failure actually was and how to think about it. Hi, my name is Nick Wignall. I'm a clinical psychologist and the founder of The Friendly Mind, a free weekly newsletter where I share practical evidence-based advice for emotional health and well-being. Today, I'm going to explain the psychology of fear of failure and show how once you understand that, you can use it to overcome fear of failure in your own life for good. The anxious achievers dilemma. Ironically, the people who tend to struggle with fear of failure most are often very high achieving and successful. So you think about successful business professionals and entrepreneurs who have years of achievement, and yet they continue to struggle with imposter syndrome and this worry that failure is just it's always right around the corner. It's going to get them this next time. Or I've worked with successful athletes and performers who have competed at the highest levels for years, sometimes decades even, and yet they still feel insecure about being a disappointment to their fans, to their coaches, even to their parents. They feel that failure in front of them. I've worked with successful creators and artists and designers who have incredible portfolios of beautiful, inspiring work. And yet they're plagued by self-doubt that this next one, despite all these amazing things they've created, the next one for sure is going to flop and everyone's going to hate it. And it's going to be a total dumpster fire. But why is this? After all, intuitively, it sort of makes sense that the more successes and achievements you accumulate in the past, the less afraid of failure you would be. In my own work, I hear this frustration echoed by my clients all the time, the ones who come to work with me for fear of failure, which is, you know, they say things like, I know intellectually that I'm not a failure, and I know intellectually that the chances are very low that I will actually fail in some big, meaningful way in my work or in my life. But I just feel like a failure. I'm constantly afraid that I'm going to fail and that I'm going to be seen as a failure. Now, the key thing to notice in statements like this, and you've probably said something like that to yourself in your head. You've probably heard that a lot of times. The key distinction here is between outcomes which is reflected in things like, I'm not a failure, chances I won't be a failure, versus feelings. I feel like a failure, and I'm constantly afraid, dot, 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 dot. Of course, being aware of this distinction is precisely why fear of failure is so frustrating on top of being so anxiety producing, because it doesn't make sense. Intellectually, we know we don't need to have this fear of failure, and yet it continues to dog us. However, if you dig a little bit deeper into the psychology underneath this fear of failure, what you'll start to see is it actually makes a lot more sense than it would seem like on the surface. And the first step is actually to look at the psychology of fear specifically and its counterpart confidence and how they actually work. Here's the big idea. Confidence is not the absence of fear. Confidence is the belief that you'll be all right despite your fear. Think about it. An Olympic gymnast, for instance, She's not confident because she lacks fear. She literally never experiences any fear. On the contrary, talk to any Olympian or professional athlete, and they will tell you they experience often a surprising amount of fear and anxiety, especially before really big performances and matches and games and things like that. The difference is through countless repetitions and practices, putting themselves into scary situations on purpose, and then performing or failing over and over and over and over again, all that experience has developed confidence, this belief that they'll be okay and be able to perform despite how much fear they feel ahead of time. Similarly, professional musicians, it's not like they never get anxious before a set or playing at a big concert. There's, if you read like biographies of musicians, you will be shocked at how many of them had horrible, horrible nerves. In fact, uh, I was just reading about the, the singer Roy Orbison, 
And he apparently wore sunglasses all the time. It was kind of his trademark, but he did it as a way to help him with his own social anxiety. He would get tremendous social and performance anxiety. And for whatever reason, wearing sunglasses kind of helped keep that anxiety in check. But the point is, musicians, just like athletes and other performers, they all feel afraid and they continue to throughout their careers. The difference is they've developed confidence because, again, they have repeatedly done the thing that's scary and fearful. They've done it anyway, despite that fear. And as a result, they've built up the belief that they can continue to do those things despite feeling afraid and anxious in the future. So the first lesson when it comes to the psychology of fear of failure is this. Don't interpret fear or anxiety as a lack of confidence. Everyone has fears, anxieties, insecurities. What confident people know and really believe is that it's okay to be afraid. It's totally normal. And despite not liking their fear and maybe wishing it wasn't there, they're willing to have it and do what matters to them anyway. Now, at this point, some of you, if you're paying attention, you might be thinking to yourself, well, okay, I guess that makes sense about confidence. It's, you know, it's not about the absence of fear and anxiety, but it's not like I don't already do these same things. Like I constantly put myself in scary or anxiety producing situations. So why haven't I developed more confidence like these athletes and musicians and other performers? It's a great question. And it's very true. People with fear of failure frequently do a lot of challenging, scary things. The anxious CEO who's constantly giving speeches in front of people, even though they have terrible fear of public speaking, or the self-doubting author who continues to uh, submit book proposals uh, year after year, despite feeling a lot of fear and trepidation. The college professor who stands up in front of a new group of students every single year. And even though they've been doing it for, you know, decades, they still lack that confidence and feel afraid that they're going to fail. So with people like this, why isn't their confidence growing alongside all these challenges that they continue to approach and put themselves in? It turns out what distinguishes insecure high achievers who frequently struggle with fear of failure from confident high achievers has everything to do with their motivation behind the drive to succeed. A tale of two achievers. Consider two different individuals. Both are VPs for very large, well-respected consulting firms. They are both about the same age. Let's say they're in their early 40s and have quickly sort of risen through the ranks at their organization through a lot of hard work, creative decision-making, and just generally a, willing to take, a willingness to take on challenging projects and scenarios when no one else would. Both have pretty similar temperaments and personalities. They are both like very personable, but also pretty analytical and systematic in the way they think. They're very conscientious. They're also incredibly hardworking. They also both have roughly equivalent histories of success in the past. They are admired by their peers and their bosses and their higher ups. And they're both being seriously considered for um, promotions to very senior positions within their companies. Okay, so very, very similar people um, for the most part. But despite these similarities, there's actually one crucial difference. There's one dimension along which they differ really substantially. The first individual, let's call him Marcus, make him a little bit more real. Marcus is almost constantly afraid of failing and frequently doubts himself. Though he seems pretty confident and put together from the outside, he would tell you that inside, he's constantly anxious and in knots. Our second person, let's call her Danielle. Danielle has, of course, moments of stress and anxiety, but generally speaking, feels pretty calmly confident on the inside. So unlike Marcus, Danielle's internal state of kind of quiet confidence, it matches her external appearance of relaxed strength. Now the question is, how could this be? These two individuals who are so similar across so many different dimensions and have been through similar experiences and had similar successes, even had similar personality traits, how could they be so different, right? In terms of this one dimension of chronic fear of failure. Well, it turns out people with fear of failure tend to share one very subtle but powerful habit. They use hard work and achievement as a way to avoid their fears and insecurities. So if you can peer inside her head, Danielle's habit of taking on challenges and usually succeeding is what psychologists would call positively reinforced. 
Now, what that means is she's primarily motivated by the addition of positive feeling and experiences that comes with hard work and challenge and an achievement. The pride of a job well done, the joy of seeing her skills and talents develop and grow over time, even having other people you really admire look favorably upon you and your successes. So she gets a lot of that type of stuff out of that. That's what motivates her to push hard and strive and achieve and take on challenges. However, if you looked inside Marcus's head, right, if you could see really clearly what's going on on the inside, his habit of taking on challenges and like Danielle, usually succeeding, is what psychologists would call negatively reinforced. What this means is he's primarily motivated by the reduction of aversive feelings. For example, the temporary relief from the fear that he won't measure up to his very impressive father, or the hope that the next big achievement will be the one that silences and gets rid of his self-doubt and negative self-talk or the distraction from this low-level melancholy and sadness he feels that comes from being constantly busy and having lots of projects to work on. See, so Marcus is motivated by the avoidance, the reduction of painful feeling. Danielle is motivated by the addition of positive feeling. Those are very, very different things, psychologically speaking. And they really, as we'll see, impact why fear of failure persists and even gets bigger in some people and not others. As we've seen with our two people here, both forms of motivation, they work in the sense that they lead to pretty incredible levels of drive and hard work, and very often for both of them, success. The trouble is in one of them with Marcus and his fear-based motivation, this also unfortunately makes him miserable and insecure and erodes his confidence instead of generating it as it does with Danielle. And the reason comes down to this concept and phenomenon in psychology called emotional fear learning. Emotional fear learning is when your brain learns to fear its own emotions because through repeated avoidance of your emotions, you've unintentionally trained it to think of them as threats and dangerous. For example, suppose whenever you feel anxious, you have this habit of immediately pulling out your phone and scrolling social media as a way to kind of distract yourself from your anxiety. Now, while you might get some very short-term relief from that habit, the second you pull your phone out and get lost in Instagram or Twitter or whatever it is, you will get a little bit of relief from the anxiety. That keeps this habit going. The problem is what your brain learns when it sees you doing this. To your brain, all it sees is anxiety and you run away. You're escaping the anxiety through social media. What the message then that your brain takes in is that anxiety is dangerous. So the next time anxiety pops up, you're going to be even more afraid of your anxiety and you're going to be more pushed to do something immediate and impulsive that will just alleviate that anxiety quickly. And often these things are not especially good for us long-term chronic, you know, getting lost in social media or using food or alcohol to kind of numb out our anxiety or stress, things like this. And you can see how this turns into a pretty vicious cycle. The more you avoid your emotions, the stronger they become which leads you to want to avoid them even more, which makes them even more and more strong. All the while, not only is your fear and anxiety growing, but, and this is the really horrible part of this, is that at the same time, your confidence is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So it's really a double problem. Anxiety is going way up and confidence is going way down because of this habit of emotional fear learning. When you avoid your emotions, either by running away from them or trying to get rid of them, you teach your brain to be afraid of them. This leads to much more bigger, longer lasting emotions long-term. And in addition to that, your confidence in your ability to handle difficult emotions like anxiety tanks. Now, let's see how this process of emotional fear learning applies to our friend Marcus from the example above. Like a lot of high achievers, Marcus learned from a really young age that studying extra hard, for example, helped him avoid the shame of doing less than perfect in his schoolwork and living up to some pretty high expectations from his parents and extended family and teachers. Well, let's say that probably not an uncommon story. I'm sure a lot of you listening to this are kind of nodding your heads like that's pretty relatable. Well, this habit in Marcus, it continued into adulthood where Marcus continued to use extreme hard work as a way to avoid the fear and shame that he imagined would come with being less than perfect in his work. 
which is now wasn't school. It was his work at a consulting firm, say. And this is, so this was true for him as a student. Now it's true for him as an employee. And it's even starting to be true for him as, say, in a new role as a husband and as a father, right? He's generalizing this habit across different areas of his life. The problem is, all the while, as he does this more and more in different parts of his life, remember, he's teaching his brain that it's not okay to feel anxious or to feel ashamed, that they are bad and that they are threats because he keeps avoiding them with all this hard work. Anytime they pop up, he avoids them. As a result of all this, even though he is accumulating lots and lots of accomplishments, his anxiety continues to rise and his confidence continues to go down because of this phenomenon of emotional fear learning. See, it's, he has plenty of confidence in his ability to succeed, of course. Like most anxious high achievers, Marcus knows intellectually that it's actually unlikely that he's really going to fail in any meaningful sense of the term. What he's really afraid of and lacks the confidence to manage in a healthy way is his own anxiety. Essentially, because he's learned over a long period of time to use hard work and achievement as a way to avoid having to deal with that anxiety, he's deprived himself of the opportunity to practice and get good at having anxiety, being with it, and then getting on with things anyway. And it's this lack of emotional confidence that's at the heart of Marcus's seeming paradox with fear of failure. Marcus isn't afraid of failing. He's afraid of feeling. Now, at this point, things might seem a little bleak for our buddy Marcus. Um, after all, he's had a lifetime of experience and conditioning to be afraid of fear and anxiety. And what's more, he's not even very aware that this is the real problem. He's still both afraid of failing seemingly and frustrated by the fact that this doesn't seem to make sense because he knows intellectually that that's very unlikely. So he still thinks he has fear of failure, but in reality, the truth is much closer to something like he's afraid of feeling like a failure or being seen as one. So it's the avoidance of anxiety and shame that's making him insecure, not his imagined failures. So is there any hope for Marcus? Absolutely. Having worked with a lot of Marcuses in my career, and frankly, being a bit of a Marcus myself, <laughs> I can confidently say that the vast majority of them are able to overcome their fear of failure, which remember is really a fear of the anxiety that comes with imagining failure. And actually more good news, these individuals often make really fast progress, faster than they would imagine, in large part because of the traits that they have as anxious high achievers. They are, they're very bright, they're very hardworking, they have, generally have kind of a growth mindset, they're re really w willing to open themselves up to new possibilities and learn. And then the other thing they have going for them is persistence. These people are nothing if not hardworking. And while it doesn't take, you know, a, another lifetime to undo all these things, it does take some patience and a willingness to continue to work at things in order to get better, some persistence. Three habits to overcome your fear of failure. Before I wrap up, I wanna leave you with a few practical ways to start overcoming your fear of failure. Because while insights and understanding the real mechanisms behind your fear of failure, that's important. It's not enough. It's not sufficient. You need consistent action too. Just like reading books about health and well being won't magically make you stronger and fit, understanding your psychology won't magically make you more confident and resilient. For that, you need to start actually doing things differently, slowly but surely, building new habits that will retrain the way your brain tends to see fear and anxiety, and to learn to see them not as threats and dangers but as well-intentioned parts of you who are simply trying to help, even if they're a little bit confused and misguided. And here are three of my favorite habits that will help you do just that. Number one, validate your fears instead of running from them. Now, validation is the simple act of reminding yourself that despite not liking how you might happen to feel, it's normal and okay and probably makes sense. For instance, if you're nervous before giving a big speech, you might simply remind yourself, hey, yes, I'm super nervous. I don't like feeling anxious. I wish I wasn't. But everyone gets a little bit nervous before public speaking, even people who look super confident. And really, nerves, this is just my body's way of preparing me for something challenging. Or let's say you've got a new idea uh, that you want to share with your team at work, but you're anxious that they'll think it's stupid or dumb. You might validate that anxiety by saying something like this, you know, proposing a new idea 
It is risky, especially because it's kind of creative and a little outside the box. And realistically, it could turn out to be a bad idea. So the fact that I'm nervous, not super surprising. But I care about this team and working really hard, and I really want this, our project, to be a success. So I'm going to do it anyway, despite the fact that it feels scary. Now, critically, validation is not a coping mechanism. It's not something you do to get rid of your anxiety. It's an exercise designed to train your brain to see anxiety as safe, not threatening. Because by saying it's valid and being willing to let it be instead of trying to run away from it or get rid of it, you're teaching your brain that it's safe. And this safety learning is what leads to emotional confidence, to the belief that you can handle difficult emotions like anxiety and not have to rely on unhealthy coping mechanisms. So don't expect validation to make your anxiety go away. That's not the point. The whole goal is to be willing to feel the anxiety and do something anyway so that you can develop that emotional confidence. Number two, take up a hobby. Yes, seriously, get a hobby. Challenging situations that involve the risk of failure, those are actually an opportunity to practice tolerating fear and anxiety and shame and other difficult emotions that go along with this fear of failure concept. And as we've just seen, this is the only path to true emotional confidence and long-term relief from the fear of failure. Now, I'm not suggesting that you deliberately fail at some big client project or that you, you know, start being a jerk to your spouse so that you can fail at being a good uh, husband or wife. That would be dumb. Don't do that. <laughs> but how about this? Sign up for a knitting class. Yes, knitting. See, taking up a hobby, it forces you to be a beginner again at something that you both intrinsically enjoy or find meaningful, but you're also not especially good at. Because by being willing to suck at something, you get a lot more opportunities to practice tolerating fear and anxiety, which builds up your confidence. Of course, it doesn't have to be knitting, right? You could, you could join a regular pickup basketball game, or you could learn to bake sourdough. You could take up salsa dancing lessons. You could sign up for piano lessons. Like it could be anything, right? <laughs> Whatever is kind of of interest to you intrinsically. But just remember, we're doing this for two reasons. Doing something challenging and meaningful for its own sake, simply because it would be meaningful and fun. Remember, all the Marcuses of the world, we often have this tendency to do difficult things as a way to alleviate some sort of fear. We're doing it to run away from something we don't like. We want to practice being more like Danielle, doing something simply because it feels good and we like it and it's enjoyable, not because it gets us out of something else. And number two, being willing to feel anxiety and fear and do something meaningful anyway. Number three, reflect on your values. Remember that the hallmark of anxious high achievers who struggle with fear of failure is that their motivation is fear-based primarily. So they use hard work and challenge as a way to avoid or distract from their fears and insecurities, which paradoxically only strengthens that anxiety and fear long-term and weakens their confidence. However, if you want to stop spending so much time and energy running away from your fears, it really helps if you know what you want to run toward instead. And while the habit of cultivating a meaningful hobby, like we talked about in the previous point, will certainly help with uh, kind of cultivating some of this joy-based motivation, it's even more helpful to deeply understand your personal values. These are the principles or ideals that matter to you most in life. And that when you're clear on them, they give you a strong sense of direction and motivation to your choices and decisions. Now, everybody has values. If you're reading this, I'm sure you value courage or honesty or compassion, or there's all sorts of things like this. The problem is everyone's got values. Almost nobody has clarified values. And that's because most people don't spend a whole lot of time deeply thinking about and reflecting on what their values are, why they're important, and what they really look like, what they really mean. And that's why they're not all that helpful in regular life. They're just kind of abstract concepts for most of us. However, deeply considered and clarified values are one of the most powerfully positive forces in all of human psychology because they motivate us toward the things that really matter most to us. So how do you get started with a ta this task I'm giving you, which honestly could be a little daunting, just reflect on your personal values. There's a wonderful little exercise that I really like and would recommend, and it's called Keeping an Admiration Diary. 
So what I want you to do is buy a little notebook or you create a notes file on your computer and call it Admiration Diary and find a time, give yourself 10, 15 minutes, with a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and sit down with your little notebook. Then I want you to list out three, four, maybe five people whom you deeply admire. Then for each person, I just want you to jot down a few notes as to qualities in them that you admire. So it might be things like creative or disciplined or compassionate, things like that. But then ideally, you also want to describe specific behaviors and actions that demonstrate those qualities. So if someone is creative, what's the specific thing they do on a regular basis that you could see that leads to them being creative? Once you've done this initial brainstorming and description, carve out a few minutes each week, just like three minutes per week. Ideally, you kind of piggyback it on some other weekly habit you have and do this for one other person each week. So just list a person you admire, why do you admire them, and then try to be specific, not just about the qualities or traits that they have that you admire, but also the specific actions and behaviors that lead to those traits. Do this for a month and you will be shocked at how much more depth and clarity you have about your own values. Because often what we admire in other people is a reflection of our own values. All you need to know. Okay, we've covered a lot. Let's take a second and review the main points. First of all, fear of failure is a misnomer because what we really fear and lack confidence in is our ability to handle difficult emotions associated with the fear of failure. Typically, this is anxiety and shame. I'm not saying we never fear actual failure, but the vast majority of time for people who struggle chronically with fear of failure, most of that fear is not about the failure itself. It's about the emotions we associate with that imagined failure. Second, don't interpret fear or anxiety as a lack of confidence. Remember, confidence is a belief. It's the belief that you can do something challenging and important despite feeling anxious and afraid. Number three, insecure high achievers lack confidence and fear failure because their motivation to work hard and achieve is primarily negatively reinforced. It's motivated by the avoidance of painful emotion rather than the addition of enjoyable emotion. Number four, people with fear of failure aren't really afraid of failing most of the time. They're afraid of feeling. The way to overcome fear of failure is to practice being willing to experience fear and anxiety instead of doing things to avoid it. Lastly, three habits that will start to increase your confidence and help you overcome this fear of failure include practicing validating your fears and insecurities instead of avoiding them or distracting from them, taking up a hobby and practicing, again, tolerating your fears and anxieties that come from being a beginner again, and lastly, reflecting on and clarifying your personal values. All right, everyone, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to learn more from me about confidence, anxiety, other aspects of emotional health and resilience, again, I write a free weekly newsletter called The Friendly Mind, and you are welcome to sign up using the link below. I would love to have you join us and be part of our community. Thanks.